and welcome to Night in on Negotiation, the podcast. I'm your host, Jeanette Knighton. My philosophy is that you cannot change the other person you negotiate with, but you can change how you negotiate with them to achieve better outcomes for you or your organization. This podcast series includes interviews, lectures, speeches, and webinars, and includes materials from all four of my books. For more information and free resources, please visit www.jnyden.com. Enjoy. Hi, this is Jeanette Knighton, the Knighton on Negotiation podcast. Today, my guest is Milva Finnegan. Milva is originally from Finland and has spent the last 20 years working for large U.S.-based companies involved in financial planning and analysis, contract management, international business, and leading diverse teams in finance-related roles. She has drafted, negotiated, and implemented hundreds of U.S. government, U.S. commercial, and international acquisition contracts. Today's conversation is on contract simplification, and Milva is completing her doctorate in economics in the field of business law in May from the University of Vasa. Her research is focused on contract simplification, redesign, and visualization to drive a universal shift towards developing more user-friendly contracts. Today, she runs a contracts consulting company, Carhu LLC, that helps clients implement contract management best practices and provides contract management specific training and workshops. You can connect with Milva on LinkedIn. All right, so welcome to the podcast, Milva. Thank you. Glad to be here. I originally met you at the IACCM which is now World Commerce and Contracting Conference several years ago because you were doing workshops and presentations on contract simplification. And I was just blown away with the work that you are embarking on. Can you tell us what contract simplification is and why it's so important? Yeah, really where um, it all started is the fact that many users who rely on contracts to do their jobs really cannot read them, understand them, or use them. And often contracts are just left in drawers after they're signed. And I really feel um, if you have a good contract document that business users, finance, HR, anybody who relies on it, can use, it can be a roadmap that really helps companies achieve that return on that procurement that they were expecting versus unexpected things happening because we're not performing to plan or misunderstanding. So it truly became a working with many teams, realizing how many people could not read or understand or even have didn't have a copy of the contract. So I'm a lawyer in the U.S. um, to frame up this conversation, and it really brought to my attention a lot of the, I'll just say, goofy ways in which we write. It's very archaic, the way that we write contracts. No one uses the word, for example, whereas anymore. And so how does your research into contract simplification and redesign help average program managers, contract managers that are faced with provisions like whereas? Yeah, I really have focused a lot on language simplification and really feel that's one main area that really is somewhere where we can help make the contracts more user friendly. And my whole idea and viewpoint on this, that we need to change how we develop contracts. And the framework is to start from incorporating design thinking. And we need to start looking at user-centered contract development. And what that means is that business users, program managers, we need to write in their language right for the audience. 
So while there's many legal terms and lawyers might be the main audience, those should be left. But there is so many business terms or finance terms where we really can rewrite, remove the archaic language, just work on writing clearer and maybe start using proper grammar, I think would really help many people <laughs> be able to read the document. So language simplification has been a huge focus area. And I have had many examples and presentations just showing we can do it if we focus on who is going to read the document. So can you give us some examples of some words that we use in our contracts, which can be confusing or archaic, have lost their meaning over the decades, and we could use better simplified words to communicate to one another what we're trying to accomplish. Sure, like you mentioned, whereas is definitely something that you know you could remove. Uh, we also have a tendency of using many words that are cinnamon, synonyms in a row. So trying to reduce that instead of saying transfer. Okay, you're going to have to cut this out. <laughs> Just lost track of the other words. Yeah, we usually say things like transfer, sell, um, and we we use a, all the words that are similar around transferring something. Um, and I remember you and I talking about this because, you know, from a technical perspective, each one has its own nuance. You can transfer something without selling it. You can sell something, but you almost always transfer what you, what's being sold. So lawyers get super hung up on that fact, but from like, for example, a program manager that's an engineer that's trying to get a supplier on site to do something for their company, those nuances are completely lost on them. The, the nuance between transfer and sell, et cetera, et cetera. So um, what do you have some specific ideas on how we might write things better? So, yeah, we can take get rid of synonyms, choose the word that more accurately describes the transaction. But are there other tips for us? Yeah, I think the other one with just the legalese terminology, use plain English equivalent. And the plain language movement is really taking hold now in all kinds of writing, legislation, healthcare. And it's really when it says at the present time, say now, concerning the matter of say about, due to the fact that, say because. Change it to those plain English words and it makes it more clear and easier for those not trained in legalese to understand it. And we really need to focus on this one word, one meaning. So really work on choosing one word and using it consistently. And we have from the redundancy we say full and complete, while you probably should say complete. And one big thing from the program manager and performance standpoint is the best efforts. While it has a meaning under the law, it's also something that can be very misunderstood. And writing clearly would really, the author should focus on really writing what was agreed to from a business deals perspective of what the deliverable is. And uh, from a grammar standpoint, it's truly the how many words you write in a sentence, one thought per sentence, punctuation. So those are really those things. And then taking those and creating rules. And many company has created style guides. So you start going, moving towards a controlled language that you've set the rules. You might have in-house dictionaries. And if we really look to the future, having a controlled contract language where certain words would be universally defined. What do you mean by universally defined? Within the company, within a nation, global? Well, really discussing globally, because many contracts, if you go by contract type, are similar. You don't really think about it, but we've ran a lot of similarity 
Uh, now with AI, you can, and they repeat words and sentences. So for example, one comparative model I looked at was in the airspace industry for maintenance manuals. That was an area where there really were issues as people across the world, where many had English as the second language, where there were misunderstandings because different words were used. So looking at that model, how they controlled it, they created a dictionary and grammar rules. And by doing this now, it's universally known which word you would use for a wrench or different tools and what you, actions you take. So looking at that model, I really saw similarities that could be done. It is in a PDF document. This was also allowing the contract management field where we have a lot of technology coming in to be able to integrate that into the writing program. And like Word, have squiggly lines, have a box show up where you can see the definition and choose if it's the right word. So it's kind of guided um, drafting that helps us stay consistent. And I'd see this could be universal. So this is fascinating. So if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying that in the aerospace industry, a group of experts came together and determined a word and a definition and implemented that word and that definition globally. Is that correct? Yeah, and today now it has, it was first in Word, then it has been integrated in software and they have something called IEDEMS. Um, not very familiar with it, but remember engineers working with it when I worked at Boeing, which is now a collaborative online where um, People who write tech manuals now have a common language. Got it. And its foundation is English. Yes. Do you see as part of the simplification movement, English being the common language for contracts globally? I do not um, think so. As we are looking at the plain language movement that I'm part of, they're trying to get a ISO standard for it. We are pursuing English as the model. While English also definitely is becoming a global language for contracts, they do get translated a lot. But translation becomes easier if you start with an English. So Shell, Boeing, they have many con contracts done in English and they get translated versus being developed in a foreign language. So having the baseline in plain English helps translation. And because today you put in contract language in Google Translate and it is not <laughs> the same. <laughs> I imagine. So um, what's the difference between contract simplification and redesign? So in contract simplification, I really discuss um, this mindset of integrating design thinking. We're not going to take any more the traditional contract, copy paste it and start editing. And the thought process is with the user centered design process. You start designing contracts and the outcome after you've looked at the language, the structure, and also visualization is where I feel is an important part of information design to make them user friendly. The outcome is a simplified document. So does redesign mean things like um, changing the outline format that we all use, Article 1, paragraph 1.1, subparagraph 1.1.1, or is it broader than that? I think it's kind of, it's both because you've got to take the elements of a contract and go, contracts are made up of clauses. Contracts are complex. They always will be. But I call these clauses building blocks and now start creating one building block at a time, considering the pieces as independent and when combined, you have the holistic document. And within these building blocks, organize them 
around users or user groups. Put the business terms first, group legal terms together. And then numbering is actually very important. And this is where information design comes in. How do you lay it on the page for easy reading? So layering it, headings, and then text, adding page layout, and then ultimately starting to use visualization, use flowcharts, tables, images, and especially for interrelated terms, having an illustration such as start time, deliverables, termination, they're all dependent on each other. Illustrating that really helps you simplify and still maintain the information that makes up that transaction. You know, this is fascinating because <clears throat> I'm working on a really complex deal for one of my clients, and we just got back a bunch of exceptions from the suppliers and we're in the down selection process. And how complicated that contract is written. You know, it is exactly what you said. The law department sent over a template. We edited it, my client and I, and said, this is not fit for purpose. So then we started pulling different clauses in from other contracts that weren't in the template that the law department gave us. But it all comes down to the law department, meaning the client that I'm mentoring and working with on this project is a contract professional. He does not have the authority or the experience to do what you're talking about. So where's the right place for a company to start thinking about redesign so that the law department doesn't send a template that's not fit for purpose to someone who's a contract professional to then start the arduous process of editing, but we're still using all the you know, archaic terms and the lousy formatting and it's very confusing. And then you try to overlay supplier exceptions into this super, you know, messy sort of document. Um, it's really difficult, but where, where should a co company start? You know, that's a really good question because most people give me pushback saying it's too difficult. And the truth is where you start is really the key. As a contract goes through a life cycle and the first step is just identifying a need. And then we do requests for proposals. They're usually very user friendly. They have pictures. They are very uh, well designed well when you get the proposals. And when you look at user centered design, you bring in the program managers, use the business clauses, the payments, the payment schedules, the scope, often great drawings. And I hate templates. Don't ever use a contract template. Rather, it's a model and we have the terms. We need scope. Scope's in every contract. Price is in every contract, I hope. Um, and <laughs> that would be a big miss. That way we leverage the proposal documents. You have business people writing business clauses and you, I believe you should start really focusing on the business in that pre-award negotiation phase. So when you go to the lawyer or start looking at it, you already have the framework with all the business terms. I believe that will make also the legal terms more accurate because the lawyers will then know, or the contract person will know what the deal is about. And especially if we have non-applicable clauses often ending up in contracts because we copy pasted a prior contract. So this whole building process that we have the right people writing the scope, the price. Now the challenge is you have to have technology to do this. And that's a big part of it, but it needs to be a technology could support multiple users with this building blocks idea. And that way it starts developing the contract in pieces. But technology gives you the authorship. You can give edit rights or read rights. And I believe if we start it early when negotiations and development and the proposals are created, that's where you start creating this very user-friendly in the right language elements 
in the contract where the intended audience on the other side, when we are now executing the contract, they're also business people reading the scope. So this is really where I think um, the focus has not been much. It's been a lot about redesigning the contract after it's been executed. And I'm saying, no, we need to change how we approach a contract from the get go and that the developers of the document are many. And those are the users who actually negotiated the document or details of the transaction and then lawyers for the lawyers. You could have finance, you could have HR, you could have risk management for certain clauses and you bring them in. The contract manager is the glue that holds it all together, but they're not the author of the whole document. So you've worked uh, for 15 years in the commercial part of the industry, for lack of a better word, but then you decided to pursue your PhD. What made you decide to move into academia to get this work done? I think what learned me in is that I like to train and teach people, but it was very siloed in one company. And this is truly an area where there isn't a lot of research done. And it's actually a lot of new ideas comes from theory to practice. So I kind of went from practice to theory and studied and read what is available on this and then took that theory actually back to practice. And the last chapter of my dissertation takes these theories and where I really found the leverage to where we need to go is looking at the proactive law movement where you really have a focus on proactively creating a document that will function to avoid disputes. Also looking at relational contract theory, which is really this, the relationship is one of the most important thing. So when you draft the document, are you documenting the relationship and is it fair? So both parties feel good. And the third element of theory really in here is the information design theory, user experience, user interface. Can the information be found? I mean, the simple things of our phones created us to intuitively use it. Those are the ideas we could use for contracts so users can navigate the document. So really, I started pursuing this PhD wanting to document how contract simplification could be done and really that underlying approaches that are important in business today are what should be helping us drive this new mindset and change how we develop contracts. So I'm I'm excited. I, I really like that journey of practice to theory, grasping the new ideas the the fantastical stuff that floats around years before the industry actually becomes aware of it and then bringing it back down to industry. So to close out our podcast today, I can't believe our time's already almost up. What three things do you think a contract manager or a contract professional should focus on today to provide value to their organization? from your research? I say contract users. Who's the audience for the different parts of the document is where you should start. Because when you know who the audience is, you can pretty quickly realize that it might not be functioning because your goal is a user-friendly document. The other thing you should look at is definitely the content within the contract and doing this Financial analysis, contracts have a value. They can either bring value or they can drain value. So each element, building block matters because there is a cost for warranty. There is a cost for liquidated damages. And sometimes because we are copy pasting, we're not tailoring and realizing that cost. And then the third element as a contract administrator is really focusing on that relationship. It is good actually to have your modification process, how you're going to communicate, having those discussions up front, this proactive approach. 
I really believe is where you will start seeing contracts becoming value creators and these documents that helps as roadmaps for business while at the same time being these legal artifacts that protects businesses should something go wrong. Fantastic. Thank you, Milva. Where can people find information about you, you and your work if they're interested to learn more? Um, we, I am on LinkedIn and my contact info is there. And as Shanette said, my dissertation will be published in May and I will publicly defend it on the 18th. And after that, I will have that also posted on uh, my website for my business, which is godhuconsulting.com. And I also have some articles that are posted there. And hopefully from here, after dissertation's done, I can take this theory to practice and uh, all these opportunities for companies to kind of start changing their current ways. <laughs> Very good. Well, I'm excited. I think that there are lots of little things that we can all do as contract professionals today to start making some very significant changes towards simplification. So I encourage all my listeners to think about the one thing that they can do today that would encourage some simplification that's focused on the user rather than on the concept that the law department has about how a contract should be written. So thank you very much, Milva, and you have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me on this show. Okay, so that was a good, I'm trying to get back so I can stop the recording. Um, there we go. Fantastic. So my assistant can go in. I'm trying to figure out how to stop recording because this is a new program. Stop recording. <laughs>